and in Henry. And on behalf of the MLK Employee Committee and the City of Fort Worth's Diversity and Inclusion Employee Advisory Board, I want to thank you for joining us today to celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. By the way, today, January 15th, is also the birthday of Dr. King. Normally, we would be having our program in person, but in these COVID times, we have had to implement a virtual platform for our program. Although many of us have mastered the technology to navigate this virtual world, one thing hasn't changed. Technology is technology, and it is still so unpredictable. This will be a live program with many different components being presented by multiple people. Therefore, I ask in advance for grace for any blips, miscues, or frozen screens that may occur during this program. Nevertheless, today's program was planned and is being presented by city employees as a way to remember a history maker who committed his life to the betterment of the lives of all people. It will include a short presentation on Dr. King, the late U.S. Congressman John Lewis, and the concept of the beloved community that both men embraced and endeavored to make a reality, followed by self videos from city employees sharing the vision for achieving a beloved community here in our great city, the city of Fort Worth. Also following the employee videos, we'll be joined by Lorraine Miller, former president and CEO of the NAACP, who also served as the, as the clerk of the U.S. House of Representatives. Ms. Miller is a Fort Worth native, and she will share with us her recollection, recollection of working alongside the late U.S. Congressman John Lewis. Now, I'm pleased to introduce to you the first segment of our program, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his legacy and the beloved community, presented by city employees, Nita Franklin from the Information Technology Department, Rhonda Prestige from the Transportation and Public Works Department, Nadia Howard from the Water Department, Katrina Newton from the Planning and Data, Data Analytics Department, and I, Cannon Henry from the Transportation and Public Works Department We'll all present to you the beloved community presentation. So let's get started. Ms. Nita, please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. It is definitely a pleasure to be here and be before you today. So I'm asking the question, why do we celebrate the MLK Junior holiday? Well, it's to celebrate the life and achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., an influential American civil rights leader. He's most well known for his, uh, for his campaigns to end racial segregation and to promote racial equality in the United States. So let's uh, take a look at some of his uh, milestones and accomplishments. He was born on January, 20, uh, January 15th, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. He attended Morehouse College, Crozier Theological Seminary, and Boston University. He married Coretta Scott King and had four children. He helped coordinate the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. He spoke of the beloved community in 1956 as the end goal of nonviolent boycotts. He founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957. And in 1960, he became the co-pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta while continuing his campaign against segregation and unfair hiring practices. He penned the Civil Rights Manifesto in, 19, uh, in June 1963, where he wrote uh, this manifesto titled, A Letter from Birmingham Jail. Also in 1963, Dr. King was one of the leaders of the March on Washington, where he made the historic, I have a dream speech. He was instrumental in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Also in 1964, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, making him the youngest recipient at that time. Then in, on April 4th, 1968, he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. 
calls for a national holiday in Martin Luther King Jr.'s honor came almost immediately after his death. A law for a federal holiday was introduced later that year, but unfortunately, the fa uh, it failed to pass. In 1970, a number of states and cities made his birthday, January 15th, a holiday. In 1983, Ronald Reagan signed the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday into law, making the third Monday in January a federal holiday and was first observed nationally in 1986. Then, in the year 2000, the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday was officially observed for the first time in all 50 states. Beloved community. Beloved community is a term that was first coined in the early days of the 20th century by the philosopher, theologian, Josiah Royce, who founded the Fellowship of Reconciliation. However, it was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., also a member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, who popularized the term and invested it with a deeper meaning which captured the imagination of people of goodwill all over the world. So what is a beloved community? Dr. King believed a beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, Dr. King's beliefs are Poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. International disputes will be resolved by peaceful conflict resolution and reconciliation of adversaries instead of military power. Love and trust would triumph over fear and hatred. Peace with justice will prevail over war and military conflict. Dr. King's beloved community was not devoid of interpersonal, group, or international conflict. His beliefs were conflicts could be resolved peacefully and adversaries could be reconciled through a mutual determined commitment to nonviolence. All conflicts in the beloved community should end with reconciliation of adversaries, cooperating together in a spirit of friendship and goodwill. Dr. King also believed that the age-old tradition of hating one's opponent was not only immoral, but bad strategy, which perpetuated the cycle of revenge and retaliation. Only nonviolence has the power to break the cycle of retributive violence and create lasting peace through reconciliation. Justice is not for anyone or press group, but for all people. It is the birthright of every human being in the beloved community. Ultimate goal is integration, which is genuine intergroup and interpersonal living, and that the aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation and the creation of the beloved community. Allow me to highlight some quotes from Dr. King in his own words. In his 1959 sermon on Gandhi, Dr. King elaborated on the after effects of choosing nonviolence over violence. The aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. 
so that when the battles are over, a new relationship comes into being between the oppressed and the oppressor. As he said in his speech at a victory rally following the announcement of, of a favorable U.S. Supreme Court decision desegregating the seats on the Montgomery buses, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men. During Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon on loving your enemies in 1963, he shared these thoughts. The way of violence leads to bitterness in the survivors and brutality in the destroyers, but the way of nonviolence leads to redemption and the creation of the beloved community. These strong words are also published in Dr. King's book, Strength to Love. In my final presentation, I leave with you these words from Dr. Martin Luther King that's published in the Christian Century Magazine article from 1966. I do not think of political power as a end. Neither do I think of economic power as an end. They are ingredients in the objective that we seek in life. And I think that the end of the objective is truly brotherly society, the creation of the beloved community. U.S. Representative John Lewis and Dr. King. John Lewis, born near Troy, Alabama, the third of 10 children, his parents were sharecroppers. While growing up in Troy, John Lewis and other African-Americans suffered inequities under a segregated Jim Crow system. John Lewis never accepted this way of life, even though his elders told him that is just the way things are and that he should not cause trouble. As a teen, John Lewis listened to Dr. King on the radio and was inspired by his words for justice and the actions Dr. King and other civil rights leaders took to dismantle segregation and discriminatory laws based on race. At age 18, John Lewis was denied admittance to Troy State University due to his race. John Lewis wrote Dr. King for assistance in suing Troy State University. Dr. King sends John Lewis a bus ticket for him to come to Montgomery to discuss further. When Lewis arrived, Dr. King asked him, Troy, to which John Lewis responded, yes, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. This was the beginning of a lifelong friendship between the two men. After further deliberation about Troy University, John Lewis decided not to pursue the lawsuit due to potentially endangering his family that lived near Troy. Instead, he decided to pursue his education at American Baptist Theological Seminary, a small historically African-American college in Nashville, Tennessee, where he graduated and was ordained a minister. While at the seminary, Lewis embraced the Gandhian philosophy of nonviolence, also embraced by Dr. King. Cultivated through his study of Gandhi style disobedience, Lewis believed the bonds of sacrifice and struggle are essential in creating a beloved community. To Lewis, forgiveness is just as important as struggle in creating that community. Like King, Lewis denounced military, militarism and the excesses of capitalism. Lewis became involved in a series of student sit-ins while in Nashville aimed to integrate movie theaters, 
restaurants and other businesses. In 1960, Lewis helped form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, commonly known as SICK, and participates in the Freedom Rides of 1961, which Dr. King supported but did not participate in. Lewis and King helped organize the 1963 March on Washington, where both men gave speeches. In response to Alabama and other Southern states discriminatory voting practices that disenfranchised millions of African Americans across the South, civil rights activists, including John Lewis, organized a peaceful march from Selma to Montgomery, the state capital, to dramatize, as John Lewis put it, to the nation, African Americans desire to exercise their constitutional right to vote. On March 7, 1965, as the marchers walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were met by Alabama state troopers who attacked the marchers with billy clubs, tear gas, and trampled them with horses. Many marchers were injured. This event, captured by TV reporters, was aired nationwide and became known as Bloody Sunday. Subsequent marches were planned, but the Alabama governor, George Will Wallace, refused to offer protection to the marchers. President Lyndon Johnson stepped in and called up the Alabama National Guard, federal marshals, and FBI agents to protect the marchers. The third and final march on March 21st was unimpeded. Thousands joined the march. The marchers in Montgomery three days later on March 24th with approximately 5,000 people supporting voting rights for African Americans. As a result of the Selma to Montgomery march, marches, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed. After the success of the Voting Rights Act, Lewis clashed with emerging Black power advocates to eschew nonviolent protests for a more confrontational stance. Lewis was in Indianapolis with U.S. Senator Robert Kennedy, who was about to give a presidential campaign speech when Dr. King was assassinated. After the 68 campaign, Lewis led a voter education project and ran unsuccessfully for a U.S. House seat in 1977. And then he uh, ran for um, Atlanta City Council where he was elected. In 1986, Lewis is elected to the U.S. House of Representatives representing Georgia's fifth district. He is reelected 16 times. While in Congress, Lewis is revered by activists for encouraging Americans to cause, quote, good trouble in the service of justice, a mantra he repeated until his death on July 17, 2020, at the age of 80. Now we would like to share a few quotes from the late U.S. Congressman John Lewis. Less than a year ago, on March 1st of 2020, atop the Edmunds Pettus Bridge, Brother John Lewis said to the crowd, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. We also reflect on a quote from the book Across That Bridge. Nothing can stop the power of a committed and determined people to make a difference in our society. Why? because human beings are the most dynamic link to the divine on this planet. And lastly, from one of his final essays, in his very stern, next slide, please. And lastly, from one of his final essays, in his very stern, aggressive, but important speaking voice, he is transitioning his work over to us. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to de demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love, and nonviolence is the more excellent way. 
Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. Well, this concludes our presentation on the beloved community. Um, well, thank you all. Well, I just see that our city manager, David Cook, has joined us. So let's pause and give uh, Mr. Cook a chance to say a few words. Thank you, Cannon, and, and hello, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank the Diversity and Inclusion uh, Committee and the Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, Celebration Committee for putting this program on. I do think it's important when we think about what's going on in our country, our state, our city, uh, the conversations and to celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. And for this program today, John Lewis, who uh, passed this past year, but who was a great leader up until right at the end. And I think uh, reading some of his quotes is um, just key on some of this. But I want to take the time to thank the committee Thank Ken and Henry uh, for putting this on. You know, it is important, uh, as I said, given our time in the country, state, and in the city. It does give us a chance to also think about and talk about the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and again, John Lewis. And in a few moments, I don't think you've heard from Lorraine Miller, but I want to thank Lorraine too for spending time uh, with us to talk about uh, John Lewis's legacy. Uh, but as we celebrate uh, the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., you know, I always go to some of the quotes that I think about that are important to me. And again, given the time, and I'll do a couple of those. The first one is, everybody's heard this, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But it goes on. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And one another favorite one is simply, the time is always right to do what is right. And I'll leave that message with everybody. There's never a bad time to do the right thing. And so again, I wanna thank everybody for uh, taking the time today to celebrate the legacy of these incredible Americans, Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis. Cannon, thanks for giving me a few moments. Enjoy the rest of the program. Well, thank you, Mr. Cook, for those inspiring words. Since the concept of beloved community is aspirational and can make can mean different things to different people. We have asked, we asked a few city employees to share their perspective via self videos of what the love community means to them and their hopes and ideas for achieving it here in Fort Worth. Hello, my name is Farida Gudeya and I'm with Fort Worth Water Department. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words for MLK celebration. It's my privilege. In my mind, the basic principle of beloved community is engraved in common good or virtue for all. What I mean by all is we, the people, as stipulated in our US Constitution. For any community to thrive and prosper, all members have to be thoughtful and respectful of everyone's civil rights and freedom without giving any preference to one group or person over the other. We live in a community and conflicts and differences will happen. When conflict arise in community, they need to be addressed without any biases in an objective and a fair manner. This is to ensure the protection of all individuals within our community. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Nowadays, the atmosphere in the U.S. is quite charged and non-trusting. It's very sad, but true. We must not believe that someone is all bad or wrong all the time. Instead, we just have to practice active and open listening, and we have to work together to find common grounds and keep moving our beloved community forward on a right path. Thank you. A beloved community should be identified as a community who appreciates 
and recognizes all people as an asset. And a community that has a low tolerance for supporting community ideas, plans, and systems that do not permit a framework of economic success for all. I believe we can achieve the goal of a beloved community by becoming more purposeful, implementing strategies and concepts to assure excellence in education through equity. Our formal and informal educational experiences shapes who we are and determines our impression in the communities in which we live. In Dr. Martin Luther King's beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated. The city of Fort Worth, of course, has a role in addressing poverty, hunger, and homelessness. It's why we raise funds every year for the United Way of Tarrant County and the Tarrant Area Food Bank as our selected nonprofit partners. It's why Neighborhood Services serves as the community action partner for Tarrant County, uh, why Directions Home works to provide permanent supportive housing, and why the city selects a neighborhood every year to receive millions of dollars in reinvestment. In the beloved community, racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. The city of Fort Worth, of course, has a role in ending racism, discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice. It's why city department directors and the city manager's office issued a statement that we, as the leaders employed by the city of Fort Worth, stand together and with our community against the injustice and racism in our city and across this nation. We believe that Black Lives Matter, and we hear and understand that we can no longer delay the need to address and condemn the impact of institutional and systemic racism, inequity, and injustice. What does beloved community mean to me? Beloved community to me means respect. The ability to respect someone for who they are, regardless of where they're from, what they have, or what they believe in. Respect is something that doesn't come naturally. It's something that's taught. And it's our responsibility to be the example and teach others. When in doubt, remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Hello, my name is Petrina. And the term beloved community, what it means to me is a place or a society where all people are treated equally, treated with respect and treated with dignity, where individuals have the ability to pursue their dreams and pursue their goals in a society that supports them. How can we achieve the beloved community? Well, I think first it's a individual commitment. One has to be committed to treating folks with respect, treating people with dignity and treating people fairly. On a broader scale, I think in our country, we do have some work to do in this regard. I think some of the systems that govern our society should be looked at. And if there are rules, if there are regulations that are contrary to treating people with respect and dignity, and the things that Dr. King um, and others have espoused, how we can be a, a better society for all, I think those systems and rules need to be changed. I think this lines up with what this country um, espouses in the US Constitution and that all persons will be treated equally to help move this country to a more perfect union. So those are my views on how we can um, achieve the beloved community. What does the beloved community mean to me and how can we achieve it? To me, the beloved community does the following. Meets the needs of those less fortunate, recognizes the good in people, searches out what can bring us together, acknowledges our differences, but does not let our differences divide us, seeks peaceful, nonviolent resolution to conflicts, replaces fear and hatred with love and understanding, and understands that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So how can we achieve that beloved community? That's a much harder question, especially in these divisive times. But here are a few things that I believe can move us in the right direction. Ignoring the noise, 
created by those who seek power by dividing and segregating us into groups pitted against each other, not accepting corruption or injustice in any form, regardless of who the individual or group that's perpetrating it, seeking to resolve differences and conflicts with a true spirit of cooperation, fairness, and doing the right thing. And finally, being less selfish, thinking about thinking of others first and putting their needs above our own. Hello, I'm Mary Hannah with the Transportation and Public Work Department for the City of Fort Worth. My idea about Beloved Community is a community where we all put our political differences aside and focus on what is better for our nation. In the end, we are all American and we should be trying to achieve one goal, to create a better environment for our future generation, to grow up into and love. In my opinion, we can achieve this goal by being able to peacefully disagree on opinions and be able to resolve conflict without hate or violence. Many, be many people believe what they read on social media and think they are facts, when sometimes they are fake news. We need to do our due diligence and research to find the truth. We should continue to progress towards this goal and try not to be biased learning toward one side and disagreeing with the other. Hopefully we all can do that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ronnie Ingram. And when I think of beloved community, I think about the fact that although Dr. King was not the first to coin the term uh, beloved community, he was the first to make it popular. Uh, for him, beloved community was a realistic, achievable goal that could be attained by a mass of people committed to and trained in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. Uh, Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision and in which people can share in the wealth of the earth. Uh, I too believe also in this philosophy that we can be a beloved community if we come together peacefully and in an organized way. I was asked to speak about the meaning of a beloved community, what that meant to me, and how can we achieve that here at the City of Our Work. To me, living in a beloved community means that every member of this community is treated with love, kindness, and respect, and is given every opportunity to live a life with dignity and to achieve happiness. Here at the City of Our Work, I believe that we are embracing diversity, and that is reflected upon our workforce and also in our programs and policies, that we continue to center all of our services with equity in order to be able to provide all the opportunities to access our services to every single member of our beloved community. I think that we must make a personal choice to choose love instead of hate, to fight injustice, and that has to happen at every single one of our relationships, personal and business alike. I believe that we have a room to grow and become a better organization and to be able to reach all of our members of our community in order for them to belong to a beloved community. Thank you so much and have a good day. What a beloved community means to me is that there's a group of people with different backgrounds and ideas coming together for the common goal of providing opportunities and resources that everyone can benefit from. We can achieve this type of community if we appreciate and respect one another's differences and make a concerted effort to make those differences work. Hello, my name is Kim Tran, and to me, beloved community means to value the dignity of work. It takes work to make a community thrive. To move towards equality and mutual respect, we must value all levels of work and service because each piece, each person, contributes to the whole. Every single one of us watching this video is wearing some form of fabric. How many hands did it require to create the shirt you are wearing? How many strands of thread had to be woven together to provide you with the warmth and comfort that you have? How much work does it take to fill up your grocery shelves with fresh produce? As we live through this pandemic, it is evident that work is required to keep the world running. We should value and dignify work on all levels provided by all people because we are woven together and this combined fabric of service protects us much like the clothes we wear. By valuing and respecting all levels of work, we help promote equality and pride in our community. When we dignify work, we intertwine ourselves into the fabric of our beloved community.
The beloved community to me is the belief that as a community, we can exist free of issues that affect our quality of life, such as poverty, homelessness, inadequate health care, access to education, and equitable business opportunities. These issues are, and I hate to use the buzzword of the day, but often systemic problems that we've faced in some form or another for generations. To a certain extent, they've become ingrained into the fabric of who we are, how we think, and how we react in society. So how can we reach the beloved community? Um, champion education and vocational training that lead to our community members achieving livable wages. Champion programs and funding that focus on mental health care, which is a leading cause for homelessness and incarceration in our communities. Uh, champion diversity and how we contract and spend our dollars within the community. Most importantly, champion equality by embracing our similarities instead of exclaiming our differences. Be a champion. Wow, what inspirational and aspirational words from our fellow employees. I want to thank each of them for taking the time to share their thoughts, hopes, and dreams for achieving a beloved community. Thank you. Now I want to introduce and welcome Fort Worth native Lorraine Miller. Ms. Miller served as the African-American clerk of the U.S. House Representative from 2007 to 2011. During her tenure of public service, she held a number of positions in the legislative and executive branches, including working for the late U.S. Congressman Jim Wright from Texas, Tom Foley, and John Lewis, and served two years in the White House as Deputy Assistant to, the pres to President Clinton. Ms. Miller also passionately supported the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, where she served in leadership roles for the Fort Worth and Washington, D.C. chapters of the NAACP before being appointed interim president and CEO in 2013. Ms. Miller, welcome, and thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to share with us your recollection of working alongside the late U.S. Congressman John Lewis and how this MLK is different now than in years past. Oh, wait. You're there. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Henry, and, and uh, for the invitation to join you for a few minutes today. That's uh, a pleasure. And I'm, I'm so glad I had the opportunity to hear uh, the other testimonials uh, from city staff. It, it's heartening. You know, today is actually uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. And I remember vividly before we had the holiday, uh, marching in the snows in DC to get the holiday. Uh, I was on the staff of uh, Congressman Wright then, um, before he was, well, he was majority leader then. But to marching with Mrs. King and Dr. King's sister, Mrs. Ferris, in the cold snows of January to, to the Capitol to make sure we have a um, Martin Luther King holiday, and then to hear uh, all of you speak so eloquently about the beloved community uh, is heartening. It, it, it makes me feel that the work that was done so early on uh, is appreciated even now. Uh, and I hope we pass it on to our kids and to our next generations because if we don't, we lose. I never had the opportunity to meet Dr. King, but I had a sense that I knew him because Mr. Lewis was a disciple of Martin Luther King Jr. John Lewis, I guess, he was the most, I've, I've had the opportunity to work for three speakers of the house, Jim Wright, Tom Foley, and Nancy Pelosi. But my, it's, it's not a word, funnerist, the most inspiring, the most fun, the most enlightening time I had was working for, for John Lewis, John Robert Lewis. There's a, 
his mom, uh, before she passed away several years ago, would call the office. And if I answered the phone, she'd say, baby, is John right there? Tell him it's his mom. And he would come to the phone. He'd be on the floor and I'd go get him and he'd come to the phone. And he said, yes, mama. And he was a very, he had, he was full of humility. If you talk about the beloved community, I never heard in the, the years that I worked for Mr. Lewis, I never heard him say an ill word about anybody. And when I read his book, um, Walking with the Wind, the first three chapters told the story of who John Lewis was. This was a young man who wrote Martin Luther King when he was 18, a freshman at Fisk University to say, I don't want, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Mr. Lewis um, genuinely believed in the beloved community. And you know, sometimes with politicians, you see something, you see them in the public and there's one persona, and then you see them when they're not on TV or in private times, but he was consistent. He believed, he really honestly believed in the beloved community. If you get a chance, you ought to read Walking with the Wind. It's one of his, I think one of his most telling books. And if you don't get beyond the first three chapters, you then get an ideal picture of the makeup of the man. John Lewis was born in Troy, Alabama. I can hear him saying it like it was yesterday. He, he called me young lady. He never called me by my name. He always called me young lady, which I appreciated, young. And Troy, Alabama, um, his family, his father had a farm and sharecroppers and Mr. Lewis always knew that he wanted to be a minister. And so he would use the chickens there on the farm as his congregation and he would preach to the chickens. And he would often say that the chickens obeyed him and took his message better than the members of Congress. But he served the people of the fifth district of Georgia, which is basically Atlanta, from 1987 until his death in 2020. 33 years as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. And this, this came about as he defeated another um, cherished friend of mine, Julian Bond. Julian Bond served for many years as the chair of the board, of the national board of the NAACP. And Julian and I would laugh sometimes about the, uh, about the race uh, that he and Mr. Lewis uh, ran against each other, which was heated, uh, but they made up. Uh, they became good friends and worked on a lot of projects. I joined Mr. Lewis's staff in the early 90s when Speaker Foley decided he wanted to expand the House Democratic leadership to, in, to reflect the more diversity of the Democratic caucus. And so at that point, Mr. Foley appointed Butler Derrick of South Carolina. Um, let's see, her name, Barbara Canelli of Connecticut and John Lewis of Georgia as chief deputy whips. These folks helped with the whip organization and, and Speaker Foley asked that I leave his staff to joined Mr. Lewis's staff to help him with his floor activities. Um, the, with 435 members and eight delegates, it is the operation of the House floor can be overwhelming. And Mr. Lewis um, wanted somebody that had 
some experience. So I had worked for two prior speakers and had floor access. So it seemed a natural. And I was so personally honored to work for Mr. Lewis. Um, this was a man who remembers when Mr. Lewis would take to the podium to make a statement, people would stop. And his, his words were listened to with such intensity. Um, it was heartening to see. Every day, you didn't know what was going to happen, who was going to come by the office, and where Mr. Lewis would, would end up. One of the things I learned from him was, you don't pack a whole lot of stuff. If he wouldn't, uh, the first time I went to Atlanta with him, um, we got on the plane, and when we got off, I checked the bag. And he says, young lady, if you're going to travel with me, we don't check bags um, on little domestic flights like this. You're going to have to travel light. And I said, well, Mr. Lewis, I got makeup. And he says, hey, you're going to have to, if you can't do it in a carry-on, you can't travel with me. So I learned how to pack light and travel light. One of the things that I always remember about Mr. Lewis was his honesty and his believability. This is a man who believed in people, who loved people. And if he thought that there was voter suppression, how many times have we gone to cities where someone would call the office and say, Mr. Lewis, they're doing voter suppression here. Can you come? And he and I, or just he, we would be on a flight in a heartbeat because he believed that voting was the it was the thing that we all have to do. You can't have a beloved community and you not participate in it. And one of the things, yes, it's respect, but you have gotta work toward that respect. And that was something John Lewis was absolutely unequivocally about. A great man, a humble man, let me tell you two things, kind of sidelines. You kind of know the history here. I took the liberty of bringing my copy of his uh, ceremony um, preceding the, his lying in state at the Capitol in uh, July and his photo. This is, these are of the things that I have of him that I treasure. This is one of my most valuable. Um, I have a, a copy of the photo. This is the photo hangs in the Birmingham uh, Civil Rights Institute. But Mr. Lewis was, um, he was funny. He had a whimsical grin. He was devilish uh, in his way, but there are two things I want to tell you about him and then I'll, I'll be done. He was a tremendous collector of African-American art. He knew, <laughs> I, I laugh because there are a lot of people who say, I've got Romay Bearden paintings. And he had some members who said, you know, um, Romay Bearden was this and this. And he would say, I knew Romay Bearden and I have lots of his work. So at his home on Capitol Hill and his home in Atlanta, oh my God, he had so many African American paintings. He knew a lot of these artists and he collected them. The second thing that was interesting about Mr. Lewis that you don't find among many members of Congress, Mr. Lewis was an ardent shopper. I mean, he could shop better than anybody. I remember in this, we went to Somalia. Um, he had um, organized a food relief program and it was a small group of us and we went to Somalia for about 10 days and we were distributing food 
that was heart wrenching to see people that live like that. But that again was his effort to expand the beloved community. And so we were had a stopover in London, and we had a um, an event um, at the um, at Buckingham Palace that evening, and so we had a two hour break. And so he said, young lady, let's go to Harrods. And I said, oh yeah, I'm ready to go to Harrods. I'd been to Harrods before and I knew exactly what I wanted from the store. I'm, I like perfume. And so I know I knew exactly where the perfume section of the, of the uh, store was and I was ready to go. So we got a cab, we went to Harrods, got in there and right at the, uh, as you walk in the door uh, to the right, is begins the men's section. So he says, young lady, come over and come on and go over here with me for a minute and just, just look a second. I said, okay, but I'm going to the perfume section. So we had two hours. Where did I spend my two hours? In the men's section with John Lewis as he was trying on ties, shirts, suits, um, and I never got to the perfume section. And then it was time for us to go. But he thought that was funny and cute. And he says, young lady, you need to spend more time with me. And, uh, but I never got, to, never got to the perfume section, but I love spending the time with him as he was uh, buying ties and shirts and, and one suit. That I hope gives you a sense of the seriousness of him as a legislator and as a real believer in the beloved community and as a man who had his own personal proclivities in collecting art and shopping. So with that, um, Mr. Henry, I, I hope I've given you a real sense of the man. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Ms. Miller, for your time. Uh, I know you have a vir another virtual engagement to attend. I don't want to delay you, but your story sharing is very much pre appreciated. On behalf of the City of Ford, thank you for sharing. We love your gift today tremendously. I know you never got to that perform <laughs> perfume session, <laughs> But I, I like your phrase, you can't have a beloved community if you don't participate in it. Yeah, yeah. So true. Yeah, right. So we thank hope, you for having me. We hope to be able to visit with you again soon. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Happy Martin Luther King Day. This is not a day of holiday. It's a day of service. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. To our virtual audience, thank you for spending your time with us and celebrating the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as a quick reminder, there, there are a number of additional local programs, events, and activities planned for the MLK holiday that are listed in the roundup, including a program by our very own Fort Library, King's Patch of Social Gospel, a virtual discussion with Dr. Dwight Watson. To learn more about the other community programs, search the roundup for the post title celebrate the MLK Junior holiday virtually this year. A link to the story also will be included in the survey you will receive via email about today's program. Thank you for your attendance and have a great long MLK holiday weekend. Bye-bye.